So welcome again. Today we will talk about symbolic AI first, what is symbolic AI, and then we will talk about expert systems and their critics. And expert systems have been used as um, examples of symbolic AI, both in the attempt to um, <clears throat> present a good, a good example of what symbolic AI can do, but also as an example of uh, as a negative example of how symbolic AI just doesn't work. So we will first uh, discuss a little what expert systems are and then how they um, have been criticized. So first, what is symbolic AI in itself? The idea of symbolic AI is to represent reality as symbols inside the computer. What does this mean? It means that the computer does not have um, <clears throat> any sensory experience of what um, things are outside of itself, outside of the computer, but it has uh, only a representation of real things as symbols inside the computer. So, for example, in Prolog, you have something like cat in brackets Tom. We talked about this already, right? So here, the computer doesn't have any access to what cat means to us. It doesn't have any understanding of a cat. It doesn't have any pictures of a cat available. Uh, but instead, what the Prolog system does is just to have this string of letters, C-A-T, and this string of letters, C-A-T, is used inside the computer to represent the concept of a cat in a way that the computer can process syntactically. It can use these symbols, it can manipulate them according to particular rules, but it does not have any knowledge of what these symbols mean or how they are used in our brains to represent things in reality. So when I say cat, I think of a cat. When the Prolog system sees cat, it just sees C-A-T. Um, okay, and uh, this letter C-A-T don't have any meaning inside the machine, although they represent the concept of cats for us. They don't mean anything to the computer. The same with the symbol Tom, right? For me, this evokes the image of my cat, um, but uh, for the computer, it's just a meaningless uh, string of letters, T-O-M. Now, Hubert Dreyfus, of whom we will talk more later, a philosopher and famous AI critic, describes the basic idea of symbolic AI as... The mind can be viewed as a device operating on bits of information according to formal rules. Now this, if you think about it for a moment, is not entirely fair. See, and you see why not? Because Dreyfus here talks about the mind. Now we already clarified in the very beginning that um, the mind is not actually the target of AI engineering. Um, no computer uh, engineer wants to actually make a mind. Um, and <laughs> symbolic AI generally does not attempt to create minds out of bits of information that are manipulated according to formal rules. This would be, this would be a strong AI uh, claim, a strong AI program that is criticized here. Dreyfus is a little unfair because it's always easier to criticize a strong claim than to criticize a weak claim, right? So I can give this a weak uh, expression. I can say the purely syntactical manipulation of symbols according to rules is sufficient for intelligent behavior. So now I avoided mind. I'm talking of intelligent behavior. So now I'm talking of uh, weak AI. And you can see that this is less controversial than the first, right? So here now I, I could say um, that sometimes this will make sense, right? Clearly uh, the syntactical manipulation of symbols can be intelligent behavior like in a calculator or in a chess playing program. The question is uh, if it is sufficient for all intelligent behavior, right? So then um, I, I had to make a stronger claim again as that all intelligent behavior, and then I would have something that can be criticized um, as a claim by 
Dreyfus. Uh, or, as we said in the last session, again a different version of a similar claim, if the symbol manipulation preserves the original relations between the symbols, the mapping of symbol to meaning can be left to the mind of the operator. This is a thing from Hogland, right? Uh, if the symbol manipulation preserves the original relations between the symbols, means syntactical relations, the mapping of symbol to meaning can be left to the mind of the operator. These different ways of expressing the characteristics of symbolic AI systems have been summarized in a famous statement that is called the physical symbol system hypothesis. And this goes like this. Newell and Simon, 1976. A physical symbol system has the necessary and sufficient means for general intelligent action. A physical symbol system means a symbol system that is made out of physical things in the physical world. So this is, is probably um, meant to exclude uh, things like a soul or like thoughts or all kinds of immaterial, non-physical uh, substances or properties that we might be thinking of. So this limits us to, to real physically implementable symbol systems. Um, where the symbols might be marks on a paper, uh, letters on a computer screen, uh, sound waves emanating from someone's mouth, um, or brain waves, uh, electric charges inside the brain that represent things in reality. So uh, such a physical symbol system has then both a necessary and the sufficient means for general intelligent action, not mind, right? General intelligent action. So again, this is a weak AI claim. And what this means, this, this is related to the idea of the Chinese room. So what this means is that we don't need real understanding or meaning inside a computer. Just like the Chinese room, it is enough if we have a rule book and we have the symbols coming in and the symbols going out. And if our rule book is good enough, then we can communicate with a Chinese person without the computer, which is the Chinese room, needing to actually understand the meaning of the symbols. Just manipulating symbols in the right ways is both necessary and sufficient for intelligent action, not for mind necessarily. Okay. So now, what are some of the problems of symbolic AI? Before we go to Dreyfus' criticism, we talk about some more general problems that are pretty obvious. One is the problem of noise. Obviously, you have in every communication channel, like now when I talk to you or when you look at me in this video picture, you have signal, which is what you want to receive perhaps the, bit, the the image of my face or the image of these slides and you have noise which is the background of the picture which might be distracting you have my voice which is the signal that you want and you have noise which is the sound of the air conditioner or perhaps if people are quarreling outside my door you would hear it this would be noise literally noise in the sense, in the everyday sense. But noise in a technical sense is more generally not, not only sound, but every kind of additional information that you don't care about, um, that is not part of the information that you want to receive, that you are interested in. So in reality, objects are never entirely clear. They can be out of focus. That There can be fog outside on the street and then you don't see uh, the objects in pictures, can have a distracting background. Voice input is obscured by noisy environments. And also our language. Uh, when I say, uh, you know, um, and, and all kinds of fillers in human language that give us time to think, for example, when I'm thinking about what to say next in these videos. I often say, uh, because right now my brain is busy thinking, uh, so I cannot form the next word until, until my brain has finished processing the next sentence. Um, so all these, all these are uh, types of noise. And these types of noise are difficult for AI programs to process because in some way the symbolic AI program would assign all these noisy bit symbols and then try to process them. And this is not what you want. You want the symbolic AI system to be able to separate the noise from the signal 
but this can be difficult right in a, in a picture it's difficult to separate the figure in front from the background um, if you ever use the graphic program trying to uh, take a figure out from the background of the picture and put it in into a new background in front of a new background you know that this kind of separating the foreground for the background is a different a difficult operation it is often unclear which parts of the picture belong to the foreground and which belong to the background so if you think of a polite request like could you please give me the butter uh, the, the content of this is give me the butter but now if you say could you please if it's not too much trouble give me the butter then you have a dozen words that don't do anything and your prologue system which has to try to analyze your symbolic system has to try to analyze this request it will be swamped with all these meaningless words could you please kindly if it's not too much trouble give me the butter um, and the real information is on in the last three words four words give me the butter so this is a big problem noise uh, in symbolic AI systems because it causes this um, uh, overhead of all these meaningless bits um, that have to be processed without actually providing valuable information. Okay, so another problem is what is called the symbol grounding problem. Now we have talked about this already multiple times. Uh, in connection with the Chinese room, the idea that symbols don't mean anything to the symbolic system. Now, what if we want symbols to mean something? At some point, when I make a robot, for example, a thing that moves and that does something in the real world, then let's say a robotic uh, vacuum cleaner on the floor, right? Then I need this robotic vacuum cleaner to actually understand what room means or what sofa means, otherwise it cannot do its job. So now I need to ground my symbols. Grounding means I need to provide a meaning for the symbol. The, the thing needs to know what actually is the sofa. Now it's not only a meaningless string of word. It has to become a thing that my vacuum cleaner can navigate around. How do I create this correspondence between words and things? How do I ground the symbol sofa in reality by providing a reference? Uh, and can the system by itself learn, can a symbolic system learn the meaning of symbols like we do as children? This is the symbol grounding problem. It's, it's not entirely clear um, how to go about it in a symbolic system. Uh, there are many different attempts to explain what happens and, and how we should do it. Uh, but it is a thing that needs more research, particularly since, you know, often our symbols in language are ambiguous. Um, um, th there is not one way sofas look. If you look into an IKEA catalog, you will find uh, dozens of types of sofas that all look different. Um, how do you make your symbolic system understand what a sofa is in the general sense rather than just this particular sofa? This particular sofa is easy, right? I, I give it some GPS coordinates, I know where the sofa is. But what if I want to be able to recognize every sofa? Uh, is there such a thing as every sofa? Can we even recognize every sofa? Uh, so this is an interesting question, but we will not talk about it now. So another problem is what is called the frame problem of AI. The frame problem is about, let's just see an example of what it is about. So I say I define paint in the following way, in a kind of, you know, rule-based, prologue-based system. If I paint X with a color C, then the color of X is going to be C. So in this case, the error would be something like an if-then, an implication in logic. If I move X to the position P, then the position of X will be P. This makes sense, right? This is what painting means. This is what moving means. This is the definition. Now I have some statements that describe the state of the world. The color of the duck is red. The position of the duck is in the house. The paint of the duck is blue. No, I, I paint the duck blue. Sorry, I paint the duck blue and I move the duck in the garden. Okay, so these down here, the four last statements are the 
statements that describe the state of the world. The color of the duck is red, the position of the duck is in the house, the, and now are the activities that I have defined. I paint now the duck blue and I move it into the garden. And then I can ask, what is the state of the world right now? What is the color of the duck? What is the position of the duck? And if you look at these statements, you will be tempted to say, think about it for a moment, what do you say? You would say, the duck is blue and it is in the garden. But is this really true? Is the duck blue and standing in the garden? Does it logically follow from the premises? And the answer is no, because by moving the duck into the garden, I might drop it into a pot of paint that is in the garden. So I move it to the garden and now suddenly the duck is yellow because it has fallen into the yellow paint. The color might get changed by the move action. So the only thing you can actually conclude is that the duck is in the garden, but perhaps not even that. I put the duck in the garden and now uh, a dog comes and steals my rubber duck and carries it away to the street. Now the duck is on the street. So the thing is that every action we perform has consequences which we cannot anticipate except in very uh, simple uh, formal systems that are limited to a very small domain. But in the real world, the consequences of our actions extend far into the future. So, for example, I paint something in my kitchen. I paint my cupboard yellow. Which properties of the world will be affected? So now you would say, obviously, the first thing to be affected is the color of the cupboard. If I paint it yellow, then the cupboard now is yellow. Um, yeah, okay, this is clear, right? What else has changed? Think about it for a moment. Not only the color of the cupboard has changed, the color of the brush has also changed. My brush now is yellow. Um, the weight of the color pot has changed because now it has less color inside. The weight of the painted thing has changed because now there's a layer of color, a few grams more. The painted thing is heavier. The smell of my kitchen has changed. My kitchen now smells of color. Now assume I've invited my girlfriend for a romantic dinner and before I painted this cupboard in my kitchen and now my girlfriend comes into the kitchen and she says, this is terrible, it stinks in here of paint. I cannot eat here, I am not eating here. I go and have dinner with Peter whose house does not stink of paint. Now your girlfriend is off to Peter. If you are unlucky, this might mean that because of painting this cupboard, your children with this woman are never going to be born. She will have children with Peter instead, whose kitchen does not stink. This means that for 20 generations in the future, your descendants will not exist, at least not in the same way, not with this genetic makeup that they would have gotten from this woman. Instead, your descendants now are different people, or perhaps you never get any because you always paint your cupboards because before you invite girls and you just never manage to work out what the reason is why you don't have any descendants. So the thing is that it, just by painting this cupboard, I create a sequence of events that extends uh, perhaps centuries into the future uh, where the world will be different because of this thing. Uh, and obviously there even this is only painting the cupboard if you explode a bomb in your kitchen you can imagine that uh, there's a ton of properties in the world that are affected uh, which are very difficult to predict so the thing is how do i know where to stop looking for consequences of my actions this is the frame problem it's called frame problem because uh, you have to imagine I, I perform an action and I put it into a frame. I, I frame it so that the action's consequences cannot go out of the frame. But in reality, they go out of the frame. Our actions are always leaking out of the frames we construct and affecting all kinds of things outside of what we actually want to affect. So how do I tell the machine which actions, actions will affect which properties of the environment? Specifically in symbolic AI, how can I describe the world with symbolic facts and rules without having to describe the almost infinite set of states which don't change with every single action? How can I distinguish what has changed after an action from what has remained the same? How do I distinguish these things? 
The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has um, another way of describing this, similar. To most AI researchers, the frame problem is the challenge of representing the effects of an action in logic without having to represent explicitly a large number of intuitively obvious non-effects. So intuitively obvious means that as a humans we know that these are not effects, uh, but how would the machine know? To many philosophers, the AI researchers' frame problem is suggestive of a wider epistemological issue, namely whether it is possible in principle to limit the scope of the reasoning required to derive the consequences of an action. So how do I frame, how put my actions into a frame beyond which I can say this action does not have relevant consequences. Okay, so that's it for the moment. Uh, let's later talk about expert systems in the next part. Thank you.